Today we're in Indianapolis at the Tinker Hill Events uh, Facility. Tinker House. Tinker House. <laughs> Tinker House. Tinker House. Okay. Today we're at the Tinker House. Um, Are we paying for this? Want to count it in again? Why don't you take yeah, it from the no, countdown? No, 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 no. <laughs> Today we're at the Tinker House Events uh, venue in Indianapolis, and uh, we're going to have another on the rocks. And this is going to be a good on the rocks because if we haven't figured it out by now, it's going to be about Fuji cameras. And uh, with me today is Michael Bobanko from Fujifilm. Oh, wait. I forgot. I, I don't have one because, you know, Michael didn't give me one, so I forgot my Fuji shirt here. Okay, go, go ahead. We're good. Fujifilm because they're uh, X cameras in the APS-C format size. And rather than enjoying the battle in the full frame, which that was a, going to be a very big battle, as you'll find out in the next episode of On the Rocks, uh, they decided to jump over full frame and go into uh, this new format. It was not quite uh, what we would call medium format. I'm going to let Michael tell us about that. But they made a decision, and at this particular point, and I have to give them credit, They've released 250 megapixel cameras, an R and an mm -hmm. S, mm -hmm. and now the uh, new 100 GFX, which is 102 megapixels. Correct. And that 102 megapixel camera, which is this baby right here, we'll go into the details on that in a minute, uh, is less than $10,000, and that's unheard of. I mean, think about this now. We're in an era of photography where we have 100 megapixel camera systems, and I'm talking nice camera systems with in-body image stabilization, uh, phase detect autofocus, uh, and a whole slew of other customizable features for less than do 10 grand. You, do you remember when we waited, decade ago, we waited for when the digital camera would meet the resolution of a 36 by 24 oh. transparency? Yeah. And that, that happened five years, years ago. ago. Yeah. And now it's just incredible. This really is a chance for Michael to explain to our viewers what this camera system is all about. We have three models that use that uh, uh, sensor size, 33 millimeters by 44 millimeters. It's a 55 millimeter diagonal. So there's the, the 50S model that uh, came out about a year and a half ago. There's the 50R model that came out right around Thanksgiving uh, at the end of 2018, and then now the 100 megapixel. So uh, all of them share the same optical uh, lineup. So when these lenses first started uh, coming out for the 52 megapixel cameras, our engineers in Tokyo already knew we were working on this camera. So all of these lenses were designed actually to outperform the 102 megapixels. So we're now finally catching up with the optics. We have in primes 23, 45, 63, 110, 120, and 250, okay? And then in zooms, there's a 32, 64, uh, F4 and a uh, 100-200 5.6. So there's only two zooms at the moment. There'll be another zoom next year. And there's another prime coming just a few months from now, which is that little tiny baby that's on the 50R. That is the new 50 millimeter 3.5. Oh, that's a nice so, little one. Yeah, I'm gonna, it? I, it, it's fantastic on the 50R, which yeah. is the rangefinder style camera. It's really an awesome little walk around lens. But if you can see this thing, I mean, it really is. A pancake, yeah, that's, you know? Look how so. skinny that is. For a medium format lens, no less. Right. Um, and the 50 millimeter lenses on some of these other... And I'm with you. Yeah. I'm going to continue calling this a medium format. I don't care what you say. So uh, I'll address. <laughs> I'll, let me address that. Let me address that. If you look at the last four letters of the company name, film, you know, we are still making film. The term medium format is a film concept. You had 11 by 14, you had five by seven, you had eight by 10, you had four by five sheet film. That was large, that was large format. So 120, 220, everything from six by nine down to 645 was the medium format. 
We're just saying that in digital terms, in the digital world, this class size of sensor is the large format of digital. Mm -hmm. So yeah. what is Fuji gonna do in 2040 when they have an eight by 10? <laughs> I think by then we're all going to just going to be photographing through the optic nerve. Yeah, yeah. Probably. Probably. just touch your ears. Yeah. They can take yeah. a picture. Yeah. <laughs> so let's let's start off with the 50R or the um, 50, mm -hmm. the 50R. Mm -hmm. The R stands for rangefinder, I presume, or the designation right. in that in that sense. Right. Uh, this is I I know a lot of photographers, uh, specifically because I kind of dabble in the landscape side of things, that have really picked up on this camera just because of its lightweight capability. It's got a flip out screen in the back so they can stand and put it mm -hmm. on a tripod and actually do a lot of their composition mm -hmm. uh, using that. Well, this camera goes for how much with say- uh, uh, It's $4,500 is the list price, yeah. So it's, uh, <laughs> with this and a, a trifecta of, of prime lenses, a landscape photographer gonna have a kit that probably fits in a space about mm -hmm. that big and uh, easily yeah. throw it in their backpack for hiking and have very good uh, file sizes for, right. for shooting. So just to clarify for the users that may not know, the, the, the rangefinder, it's the rangefinder style because the EVF right. is over here in the, on, on the corner. It's not a true rangefinder, it is an EVF. Yeah. And I like the fact that it's off to the side because mm -hmm. you know this allows you to put it up to your uh, eye and mm -hmm. not have your nose kicking in uh, on the, the screen. Some of those are exactly. left eyed. Well, don't, you know. You just want to go like this then. Yeah, don't, <laughs> don't be down on us because we're left eyed. Well, you know, Jody. Uh, we love everybody, Jody. <laughs> we, we, we have a friendly playground here. Yeah. <laughs> and then we go into the uh, 50S. Yeah, so the 50X S actually came out before the R. What I've been saying is think of S more as studio and R more as roaming. Okay. That's, a good way to put That's it. another way. So one of the things the S does get is this is an optional vertical battery grip. So uh, each of these have only one battery only. So the S, you get the optional vertical grip, which does uh, give you a second battery. Um, but this one's a little bit heavier because this has a larger viewfinder on than that. And this viewfinder is removable. This one comes off. That one is fixed. Okay. So as, also this one has a little bit more of a uh, few more knobs on it than the R does. So they're slightly designed, slightly different designs, but the actual sensor, the actual processor between them are exactly the same. There's no difference in image quality or auto uh, focus or anything like that. Yeah, when yeah. it came out, we had a lot yeah. of people that really, really were, were, were happy with it. Now, we have a, a much larger battery with this uh, camera system, correct? Mm -hmm. These aren't, and the battery is good for about how many exposures? You know, typically the official of? SEPA measurements are like 400 shots. Yeah, so you know, that's, that's the, the standard that all manufacturers go by. So um, I think they tend to last longer, but that's. Now, I've, I've had this in my hands before, and let me kind of point this out. Uh, to our viewers because I think that there's, uh, you paid a lot of attention. When, when Fujifilm decided to design these cameras, they gave ergonomics a lot of thinking. And there are some other camera manufacturers out there that get very criticized for their uh, ergonomics and design of their cameras and they get to be hard to hold after a while. But one of the things that I've always appreciated about Fuji, at least on this format, is they've got these uh, thumb areas that come out in the back. Now, some mm -hmm. people may knock them because it kind of like sticks out and so forth. But when you can put your camera and hold it and press together, you get a nice firm grip and your thumb fits nicely in there. And the same thing is on the vertical. Rather than put it all the way up top, which is kind of uh, cockeyed, it sits there so that the camera can sit in the base of your palm very nicely. There are some cameras really well. now that don't have that to the point where manufacturers, second party manufacturers have made uh, like add-ons that en enable right. this. This is really smart. So the other thing I like is we've got on all the cameras, oh no, except for the uh, the R, but on the new 100, there's a, a display at the top too. And I want you to go into a little more detail on, on those for us. So the, uh, the, the display on the top, we call the sub monitor and it's just info. There's no image displayed on there, but it's, uh, it's, it's shooting info and you can customize what shows up here. But again, this is just camera info, but you know, there's a backlight so you can see it in the dark and you can swap the contrast, white on black or black on white. 
but it's very useful, it's very handy, and it does tend to stay on, uh, at least on the, the, the 100. When you turn the camera off, the information stays on the screen for a period of time. These still do have uh, the old traditional styling of shutter speed, ISO, you know, and the f-stop is on the is on the lens. F-stop is yeah, on the lens. So it takes a little bit of thinking, uh, specifically if you're not used to the Fuji systems, in regards to you know really set the camera system by you know S or A or M or P. Uh, it's all determined whether you go to A on the lens for your f-stop, A on the shutter speed, or A on the auto ISO, and so forth. That all kind of determines where you're going and which one would actually be you know P for professional, um, but uh, quite clever the way you've done that. Now on the 100, you've done the same sort of thing, is that correct? Good segue there. Mm -hmm. uh, this actually, yes, we actually did a, a design departure. Okay. So uh, thank you for complimenting on that, and now we, uh, we, we taketh away. Um, uh, do you believe it? Yeah. Uh, we primarily what we did was we did away with the knobs as much as possible here in order to help with the weather sealing, for mm -hmm. better weather sealing. So this one uh, it doesn't have an ISO knob, it doesn't have a shutter knob, it goes back to wheel operation. So on the GFX 100, shutter speed is on the back wheel, ISO is on the front wheel, and then the uh, f-stop stays on the lens. Now, uh, you can, I mean, change all that. You can make f-stop on the front sure. wheel, you can swap ISO, you can, sw you can swap the wheel operation if you want but we did away with those knobs, primarily for weather sealing. Um, and also in acknowledgement that at the, the 100 megapixel level, probably at least 50% of the user base in this are probably gonna be tethering. tethering. So they're in looking the at a laptop screen, they really don't, they, they're really not accessing the knobs yeah. anyway. Is it a USB-C uh, tethering or a USB? Correct, USB-C. USB-C. Okay. So you can also power the camera through the USB-C if charge you want. Charge the camera? You can charge the batteries while you're shooting or run it from that. So there's HDMI out. Okay. There's also a barrel plug, so around 15 volts. So you can, uh, uh, so this camera does phenomenal video as well. There's a lot of people in Hollywood super excited about that. Really? Cool. This will run off of a PTAP uh, battery, right. standard oh. V-mount or Anton Bauer type of battery uh, that's very popular in the broadcast world. So will it so, record to your HDMI, you, you, you want to record it to an off, uh, um, uh, like an off-site or off-camera uh, storage well, or internal? So it, it does full 10-bit Cinema 4K uh, video. So Cinema 4K is 4,096 right. pixels as opposed to 3840. Uh, it's a 17 by nine aspect ratio. It does 10 bit internal and 10 bit external. External. So, so uh, the internal data rate is 400 megabit per second. Okay. So it's very high data rate. Very interesting. I would never have thought that uh, I would see, uh, specifically because we're seeing so much in micro four thirds as well as full frame on all these new video formats. And I suppose Sony's gonna surprise us somewhere along the line with a new 7S camera. But the, you know, I would just think that most people would want to be shooting stills with this. And you're saying this is quite popular as far as video. Well, most people are still shooting stills with it. I'm saying there's been yeah. a huge uh, upswell of interest in this uh, because in the cinema world, if you look at what's out there, there are the largest you can get right now is a what's called the full frame, the 35 okay. millimeter full frame, with the exception of two camera models that are larger than that. And this falls in between those two cameras. All right. The growth of video, period, uh, not only to the repertoire of a normal studio photographer that now has to learn how to do video and deliver both. You know, right. Right. And, goodness, and, we have Michael Dirk. Which you never see, but he's back there. <laughs> <laughs> Waving at us right now. <laughs> Look at the time. <laughs> um, okay, let's talk about specs. This is a 16-bit uh, camera or 14-bit? Uh, it's a 16-bit sensor. It will deliver full 16-bit uncompressed files. You can shoot. 16-bit or 14-bit, it's up to you. Okay. Yeah. File so, size is roughly the same then? The file size is roughly the same uh, because of the way bits and bytes work, uh, but we're talking about you know a 200 megabyte raw file, so which equates to about a 600 megabyte TIFF. It, it does get up there, doesn't yeah, it? Yeah, the JPEGs are between 50 and 70. You know, so, one of the things that I, I hear quite often that, and of course, you know, I've been doing medium format uh, in, in this kind of size for, for a, a while, uh, is that it will choke up your system. Yes, it will take up a lot more space on your drives, but uh, Capture One, who you have a very close affiliation with, Lightroom, and uh, then there's now Luminar, others, 
uh, they, they work pretty fast with the corrections and moving files yeah. and, and, and working. So uh, I haven't seen any issues nope. as far as uh, using the larger files in the software. Um, yeah, it takes a little while to get across the system because you're working with bigger files, but it's not all that bad. And for those people that are questioning, like, what am I going to do? Am I going to have to buy a lot of storage? Storage is pretty cheap these right. days. Come on, right. uh, you know, it's ridiculously inexpensive at what you can get storage-wise. Well, the only thing in terms of storage, the only thing that we tell people if you're going to buy this, and we were saying this even with the 50, was you know, get the UHS-2 cards. Yep. They're the ones that have the double, double row of double contacts. Row. They're about $20, $30 more expensive, but five frames a second, which this camera will do, you know, of 200 megabyte files, you want a fast card to clear the buffer out, or you might as well just go out and get a cup of coffee and then come back. All right, speaking so, of cards, is that a dual cards or a single? Dual cards. Dual cards. Dual lots. cards, and they're both UHS-2 capable. Okay. Yeah. So that's that's that means you got a lot of speed. Now, that five frames a second, is that for JPEG or for RAW? No, that will do it in RAW. It will do yeah. it in RAW. In 14-bit. In 16-bit, it will only do one frame per second. All right, so, so let's talk a minute about 14-bit and 16-bit. So, and jump in where you have to in case I don't explain this right. But you're, you're talking a huge amount of more information per pixel as far as um, the, the, the white to black scale. Mm -hmm. And essentially, the best way it was described to me back in the day was if you were a car photographer and you're shooting a black car and you've got it flat lit and you've got an area with a specular and that black goes from white to gray to pure black. On a 14 bit, it's going to be a lot rougher going there because you have less uh, grayscale in increments to work with. Uh, on a 16 bit, it's much, much smoother. In many cases, depending on how you're shooting, like if you're shooting landscapes or portraits, chances are you're not gonna see much of a difference between 14 and 16 correct, bit. Correct. However, if you're really getting down to maybe some real fine still life where you know shooting a lot of frames per second isn't going to matter, capturing in 14 bit will fine. But if you're you know, really trying to get that detail and that micro detail and you're going to be blowing it up large, that 16-bit file, true 16-bit is nice to have. Yeah. If you are doing significant pushes and pulls or if you're doing major uh, color shifts, like if you're going from 6,000 Kelvin, you're correcting it to 2,800, you, can, you will very definitely see some banding in the 14, whereas a 16 will preserve it, yeah. Another thing that a, a lot of people uh, have a difficulty in understanding and there's a lot of misconceptions and hopefully you can explain it from the Fujifilm side of things. Compression versus non-compressed. To me, uh, you know, a lot of people think, oh, if you're going to compress a file, you're going to throw something away to swish it down. And of course, we've heard for many years the words lossless and lossy and all that stuff. So from your side of things, What's the advantages? What's compressed versus uncompressed? And where would you use it with your camera systems? We offer uh, compressed and uncompressed, but the, the compressed is lossless. It is not lossy. Okay. Uh, I am not a data engineer. Uh, I could not tell you how they do it, okay? Um, but basically, it doesn't save you a lot. It saves you about 10% of file space. And that's really all it comes down to is just being able to get more, more files onto the card. Um, faster uh, throughput of, for the processor and that, you know, but uh, there's there's no reason not to shoot um, the, the compressed if you want. You're not going to hurt the file quality at all. So okay. so you could do a side by side, you're not going to be able to. Uh, you're not going to see the difference yet. Um, mechanical versus electronic shutter. Does this mm -hmm. camera have both and why and when would you use these? It does have both. So the first thing is if you're doing anything with flash, you have to use mechanical shutter because that's okay. the only way to sync the flashes. It has to be the moving curtain. There is electronic shutter, which obviously would be for shooting uh, outdoors at very, very high speeds. If you're shooting like with the 110 F2, you want to shoot wide open for super shallow depth of field, but it's a bright sunny day. You're going to need a high shutter speed. So the electronic shutter will go way up to 16 thousandth of a second, okay. um, but you can't do flash sync. So there's also something called electronic front curtain, okay. which is a sort of a half and half. Uh, and what that does is simply minimize the amount of shutter shake uh, by not using the front curtain at all. It leaves the front curtain parked open and just uses the rear curtain to end the exposure. Um, speaking of shutter shake, this camera has in-body image stabilization. 
So up to five and a half stops where the entire sensor shutter assembly is floating and dampened on an active in-body stabilized system. So you can hand hold this thing down to an eighth of a second or a quarter of a second, depending on which lens you have, and get a nice sharp picture. And it's especially helpful with the video. Does that where, increase when you use the image stabilized lenses? Uh, the maximum we get is five and a half stops, and that is with a 63 millimeter. Uh, but you could say put third party lenses on there. You could put old 40 year old legacy lenses on there and you'll get up to five. Up to five. So five, that's using the body stabilization only. So what it is with the lenses that do have the optical stabilization in the optics itself, the camera and lens talk to each other and they will affect which uh, axis needs to be corrected depending on where. Um, but any other lenses or like I say, any kind of third party thing you put on there will get up to five. So I, I assume the electronic shutter can be silent. Well, sorry, yes. So if you are, say, shooting a wedding with this, yes, absolutely. That's the main reason. And like the smaller cameras, the X-T3, the X-H1 are darlings right now in the movie business for unit photographers, the on-set photographers, because they're electronic shutter, 100% silent, oh. which they means they don't have to do no, blimps no anymore. Yeah. The company that makes blimps electronic. went bankrupt last year. Yeah, I wouldn't so, be surprised. Yeah. I have an article coming up on yeah. the site on uh, yeah. a guy who shoots stills on a set and you know, how he had to use to blimp. And yeah. I remember I used the blimp system and it was quite awkward. Yeah. If I'm using a lens with OIS, optical image stabilization, in conjunction with the IBIS, uh, if I turn it off on the lens, I turn it off the IBS too. That's correct. So the ones that have OIS, they have a switch on the side. Uh, so uh, optical stabilization technically works better. Um, so the assumption is if you are going to switch the, the switch to the off position, that means you don't want it at all. Um, and there's very little reason actually to turn it off because even on a tripod, the stabilization can be helpful. Like say this, uh, this is an older building mm -hmm. uh, or say if you're on an old wood floor or say you're shooting somewhere out on a street where there's lots of buses going by, there's vibration in the ground. So if you're saying a quarter of a second or a half a second, the stabilization is actually going to help a lot whenever a bus goes by. I say that even for landscape shooters. Um, mm -hmm. You know, it used to be we would, as a rule, somebody would say, "Oh, you got to turn if you're on a tripod, you got to turn the, uh, the image stabilization off, regardless of whether it's IBS or optical." In Manufacturers some, have stated that to us. Yes, but in reality, if you really put it, and I saw it with the Phase One system, they have like a seismograph in it. That, there is amazing how much vibration, even when there's no wind blowing, is coming through that tripod. And uh, I have found that if I leave my image stabilization on, that you know any kind of little wind shift or anything like that, the IBS does a very nice mm -hmm. job you know, doing it. So um, if you're in doubt, do one with or one without, but you know, sometimes you'll find that by leaving it on while it's on the tripod, it's also a saving grace. Just it's one more little I'll assurance. I'll test it out as soon as Michael sends me mine. <laughs> One of the things that I, I've seen on the forums is that there's been some issues with the... Oh, oh sorry, start over. start over. Take the glass away from him. <laughs> sorry, I'm sorry. One of the things that I've been seeing on our forums and some of the others is the fact that a lot of people are having some problems with uh, the, the, the switch uh, on the vertical grip. And uh, one of these people reported that Fujifilm was really standing behind us. Tell me a little bit about that part. We issued a service advisory uh, a few days ago. Uh, this is the end of July. Um, and what happened, we found that there was a, a certain lot of serial numbers that had a little problem in production, whereas uh, the vertical shutter button lock, not the shutter button itself, but the little rotating lock here oh. that goes around it, uh, there's a little, the little thing that holds that in the lock position uh, would come loose. And so it wouldn't lock. It doesn't mean anything, any, everything still works fine. It just, it won't lock. Uh, and so uh, we've issued a service advisory that should your camera have that problem to please send it back. Of course, we'll fix it 100% uh, for free. Um, but everything else about the camera is perfectly fine. This says a lot. Now, we just kind of, one of the things that I've, always enjoyed about Fuji. Um, even with the X cameras and early X-T1s and the X-Pro and the X-Pro2, is that they continually, and they're famous for coming out with new firmware. And many times, some of this firmware was so substantial 
it was almost like getting a new camera because mm -hmm. the capabilities mm -hmm. have changed drastically and that still is true. And I see that you're gonna carry that on with what you're doing with this. And this is why I think Fuji's made such a name for themselves in a rather short time, if you really think about how long the X cameras have mm -hmm. been out and what you guys have been doing. Um, they'll be able to, you know, on a regular basis, release new features by firmware and to stand behind something when it happens like that and not hide behind something and, you know, not be able to answer. Uh, you know, gives me, uh, me, a, me as a, a photographer, a lot of confidence that I'm buying into a product that, you know, will get repaired. And let me say something about repair. I've got a lot of Fuji X. I got X-T3, X-T2, the X-H1, and a load of glass. And I had some problems with, uh, I think it was and the And a GFX 100, right? <laughs> Soon? <laughs> You might as well just get your hand in my wallet now. <laughs> <laughs> but one of the things that uh, I had a problem with one of the lenses, I think it was a 40 to 150. Is that a one? Or is it 50, 50 to 140? 140. Mm -hmm. I always get those two backwards. But um, I had to send it in, and I made a call, sent it in, and within three days, I think it was roughly, I got it back, and boom, it was a very small fee to, to get it fixed because it was out of warranty, and I didn't have to wait an extraordinary amount of time, and it was just no BS. So, uh, you know, this is just one more step in that wow. direction. Thank you. One of the things that I'd like to kind of point out here and is we, you talked a little bit about the top display and the fact that you don't have knobs up front here. One of the things this display does is simulate uh, the knobs. Uh, See, I knew I hit a hot button before. <laughs> <It's good. laughs> so, it is pretty slick. So. Yeah, so uh, like I said, on the 50S, you've got the shutter right. speed, the ISO knob and all that. So um, this top display, um, so by default, you can, it has the, the info and you can set up what you want on there. You can have it as much or as little as you want. But this little button here uh, changes that display from numbers to wheels. So if I change shutter speed, the shutter speed numbers have changed. If I change ISO, that changes. And of course, the f-stop is here. Another thing, if you press that button again, it becomes a histogram. <laughs> so you can have a, a full histogram here on the top or info, any kind you want, you know, but then of course we've got, uh, you can customize the, uh, the screen back here, the LCD or the EVF. You can put an histogram on there and a level and all kinds of stuff. Now, right now it's showing uh, exposure info, white balance, that kind of stuff. And that's if you decide you want a completely clean LCD and you can still get your thing. I can go into the menu and I can set this to be a histogram. Wow. So I can have a histogram back here. So you yeah. could be looking and the live view mm -hmm. with unobstructed by data. And there right below it is the histogram. The histogram is based off the JPEG representation of the image, is that correct? Correct, is right, right. So, you know, I, I know everybody will ask that sooner or later, so let's just get it out. I don't know of too many cameras, if there's any, I think maybe Phase does it, Phase One, but um, mostly every camera works off of, uh, the readout of a JPEG, it's, which it's they process, the process off a processed picture, yeah, which correct? Have to do yeah. Internally, yeah. So, but it, I mean, it does. If you change the film simulations, you know, you'll see the you'll see the contrast levels will change if you go into low contrast, high contrast, you know. Yeah. Um, but now, all the film simulations that we're accustomed to on the X are they available on this camera? Mm -hmm. Now, yep. If you haven't in, ever, including the Eterna, which oh, we're very proud of, that's, that's the motion picture a, film stock like emulation. Yes. I should just yeah, saturate it. Yeah, everything about you is gold and blue. <laughs> <laughs> One of the things that I love about shooting with the Fujis, and I uh, would do the same thing with this, is uh, shoot a RAW and a JPEG at the same time. Mm -hmm. um, some of these film simulations are so good. Uh, I particularly like the Acros, and then I can pick a red or red filter if I really want to shoot yeah. Acros out there with a dark uh, sky. And so, there, I mean, there's a lot of selections you can work. But the nice thing is, not only do you get the JPEG out with, according to the film simulation that you want, but you also always have the RAW file. Now, the RAW file might come into certain uh, RAW processors like Lightroom and Capture One, reading the fact that it was shot with a film simulation and thus be displayed that way. But it's a true RAW file with all the color and everything which you can do. But all these, uh, most of these manufacturers, I should say, I'm not gonna say all of them, uh, have the film simulations that you can select as part of the raw processing side mm -hmm. of things as mm -hmm. a, a preset or a style, depending on who you're using. So uh, you've got kind of like the best of both worlds. You've got a JPEG, which comes out really good. I know some guys 
that are actually using their JPEGs mm -hmm. as a judge on how good they're doing processing their RAWs because the JPEGs coming out of these cameras are so nice. We actually have a free software called uh, uh, Fujifilm X-RAW Studio, which lets you plug the camera into your laptop and it uses the camera actually as the processor because the processing engine mm -hmm. isn't here. Uh, and we did that because some people actually want our exact, exact film simulation color science. So we can't give that to third parties because of proprietary sure. information, but our, our software will let you do that. So yeah, it's, it's quite yeah. nice. Now, another thing we didn't cover, which you've been fiddling with, but let's talk about this and I'm gonna, I'll let you put it together. The, the other thing I really enjoy about this, right now you see we have just a straight old viewfinder and it slips on, I'll let you slide it on and yeah. do it so I don't have to send this camera in for repair when I break. <laughs> there's, the, there's the viewfinder. Okay, and that, that clips into this. So, and this, just FYI, this comes with the camera. Okay. So some people ask if that's extra, it's not. This, however, is an accessory, but this is one of the coolest accessories on the planet. Yeah. All right, so <laughs> it's, it's yeah, it's, <laughs> it's, it's uh, the viewfinder slips on there. Yep. All right, and then this, slips into the shoe on the top. And now, what do you have? Oh, I love it. I mean, back in my Hasselblad days, I mean, always had like a, a look, the, the, and yeah. Yeah. this thing is just so nice because, you know, if you're pointing up in the high shots, mm -hmm. you have the ability not to have to, you know, get behind it to be able to see mm -hmm. it. And uh, if, you know, you just want to kind of work at a more comfortable level like this, uh, you don't have to bring it all the way up to the eyes. So and it's it so also, nice and versatile. In, in portrait mode, it does 45 up and down. <laughs> so Sweet. You, you, can, yeah. you can adjust it this way or this way, so any way you want. So It's going to be exciting to see where, where Fuji goes with these cameras. Um, one of the other things I paid a lot of attention to, and it's always annoying, on most of the full-frame cameras that uh, we work with, all the connections come out of the left side of the, the camera for the... Um, cable release and so forth. And in many cases, the L bracket is set the same way mm -hmm. so that you know, your L bracket is squishing on the cables. Uh, what uh, you did here was mm -hmm. you've you put your cable release here on the right side. Right. So, um, so it's the, standard 2.5 millimeter yeah. plug that any universal release will work with. I see this as a landscape photographer's dream. And I think one of the things that I've heard a lot about is the autofocus. When, is there a difference between the autofocus on this camera and the 50? Oh, miles, miles of difference. So these two, uh, the sensor being the same, the, have contrast detect only, okay? And it's a limited number of points that doesn't cover the whole sensor. This is a hybrid of phase detect and contrast detect and it's full sensor coverage on the autofocus. It's blazingly fast autofocus. It tracks incredibly. It even has eye tracking. Oh, yeah, eye yeah, tracking yeah. is, really? I, uh -huh. yes, yes, it's quite that remarkable. So slick. this is a real performance beast, you know, compared to the other. Which harkens back to when uh, our dear friend, George Tiedemann of Sports Illustrated started doing NASCAR with medium format cameras oh, 10 yeah. years ago. I remember. Now, I imagine that. using this autofocus system yeah, right, to good. do NASCAR. Oh. Well, it'd be fun, wouldn't it? It would do. be fun. Well, yeah, we have a track right down the street. <laughs> yeah, let's go. <laughs> I got to admire camera companies these days that listen to the customer and actually design products based upon, specifically before they even release a product, on what you know users uh, say about you know the hold and what's needed and what's what's not. What lenses should come first, and uh, you want primes and zooms, and you know is this important? Is that important? Uh, Fuji is one of those kind of companies. Once again, Fujifilm listens to what you have to say. They listen to their users. They're easy to access if you need technical support. And you know they've thought of all the things. You know something along that line. Just something as silly as putting the cable release on the right hand side. Thumb support. Uh, thumbs and, and the thumb support, like I showed you earlier. There's just a lot of smart things that were done. Um, I haven't shot with the 100s yet. I've had the opportunity to take the 50 out every now and then and and shoot with it, but I really do look forward to the shooting with this. The image quality is mind-boggling, yeah. absolutely mind-boggling. When you pop it up on a computer screen or you print it, and I just want to say, the thing about resolution, I'm just going to come back to the optics, is people think it's just all about megapixels, but resolution is a system. Yes. There's glass and sensor that together. It's not just the megapixels. What the problem is now is these files are so high res that many monitors 
even at some of the higher res, and most of what okay. are, some of those are 172, 140s, 4s, and so forth, can't, can't resolve the detail of what the file is. I mean, really, truly, you can only appreciate the detail that's in one of these files when you print it out. Michael, thanks for coming on by. It's a great pleasure. Let's raise our glasses to another On the Rocks. Yes, one more in the can. I want to specifically thank Robert's Photo, who's our partner in this uh, great you. program, uh, Fuji Film for coming out here and spending some afternoon with us and drinking some bourbon, side yeah. benefits of the job. <laughs> and uh, all of you for visiting Photo PXL, where we're working to enhance your vision. If you like this video, please make sure you stop at our YouTube channel, subscribe, and hit that bell to be notified for the future videos. And speaking of, we've got a, more On The Rocks coming and a lot of other exciting content coming your way. We haven't had this much fun for quite a while. I mean, I'm back in the groove and Glad. we're having a blast. So once again, cheers everybody cheers and thanks everybody. for joining us. Specifically, thank Robert's photo. He said Robert's photo. Didn't even notice. Uh, <laughs> it was really good. I'm losing my brain. What I'm doing.